a little bit. Did uh, you speak to the plaintiff's attorneys over the break? Yes. And what did you guys discuss? Um, I noticed there were some things that I thought we might cover about the impact on the brain and the body. Um, um, that was, I don't remember many other details. How long was the conversation? A few minutes. You testified to the jury earlier that for Neil and Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, finding out that um, a quarter of all Americans believe uh, they're liars was tremendously hurtful. I don't know. I think they probably didn't know that earlier. It was when Neil was singled out um, and and attacked, um, and they found out that there was an increasing amount of talk about it, and people were harassing them. Um, that it became very distressful. We were okay. talking around like 2018 is when they told me it became really a serious problem for them emotionally. So. As I, as I take it now, what you said earlier about how they walk out on the street and they don't know which, uh, which person might be somebody who's a Sandy Hook denier and how that causes them a tremendous amount of stress because of this, uh, this poll, um, that's not the primary reason of their distress. It's not just the poll. I mean, certainly thinking that many people are deniers adds to the problem. But the, the real problem and the tremendous fear they have is because of threatening calls, threatening messages, um, people confronting Neil on the street, um, and the intensity of the statements. I think if it was just that one quarter of Americans didn't believe it, they would. I don't. That's not the problem. It's the the anger and the venom and continual attacks. Let me ask you this. Um, was it Alex Jones who told them that uh, there was a poll that said that a quarter of Americans didn't believe them, or was it someone else? Um, I think they got, I don't recall Alex Jones telling them. Do you think it was something they heard as part of this litigation? I don't know when they heard it. You said um, that Alex Jones 100% caused these parents mental anguish. I, wait, wait. I don't think I said 100% of the mental anguish is every drop of it is from Alex Jones. Um, what I was saying is that Alex Jones uh, using his, his, his uh, pulpit and oratory um, pushed the issue and kept repeating it and in a very attacking way and stirred people up and then some of those people have have followed and calls and shoving Neil and and made them very frightened. So as you sit here today you're not expressing an opinion as to what um, percentage, if any, of the harassment suffered, if any, by the plaintiffs was caused by Alex Jones? I think Alex Jones drove, well the question before was different than what you're saying now. Before the question was 100% of their anguish. Um, I'm saying that you know, there are other things that are painful in life as well, um, but that, you know, they would not be they would not have complex PTSD, they would not be suffering, they would be able to do positive things in life, enjoy things, sleep okay, enjoy normal activities and relationships, had it not been for the Alex Jones driving many people to see them as these evil people. And um, 
So your position then is that it's Alex Jones's fault that they suffer mental anguish. I think sometimes that's an issue for a jury and lawyers, but if that he he is the root cause that there is such a tremendous um, this goes on and on, and that the statements became so vituperative, and that they were suffered character assassination and vilification. If someone had simply left it at, you know, we're not so sure that, that this occurred. I don't think that, and they knew that there were deniers earlier on, but it was after Alex Jones was pushing it and intensifying the rhetoric that, and people then responded that they became much more fearful. And you would concede that you did not take the time to substantiate that anybody in fact responded. True? That anyone in fact responded? Responded by harassing the parents. You did not take any steps to corroborate that that actually occurred. True? The, um, it can't be answered yes or no. Okay. Um, you know we're on national television. Yes. And uh, if somebody watching you testify went out and did something to Alex Jones, do you think that you should be held responsible? No. Um, you didn't substantiate I, your sources. It's not standard practice for forensic psychiatrists to um, call up police and see if the individual is making up what happened. Um, it's standard practice, and what I write about in my article, I have a big section on malingering, is do the pieces fit together? Does the pattern of emotional harm or, mo or depression or trauma, does it fit together? Um, does it make sense, or is it a strange pattern that is doubtful? And is the problem that they're pointing out, the event or events, could that cause the symptoms that they're reporting? But, you know, I am not aware of um, Neil going and reporting to the police or taking a picture of everyone who shoved him. Um, so I don't know how it could be corroborated, you know, in, in terms of you know, absolute proof. But I do accept that it's happened. So let's go back to um, let's go back to a, an earlier question that I don't think we got fully clarified. Um, as you sit here today, do you know if Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis were ever uh, exposed in the sense that they ever actually viewed an Alex Jones broad, uh, broadcast prior to uh, 2017? I don't know if they did before 2017. Do you have an opinion on what percentage of the mental anguish that you have described is attributable to participating in this litigation? Um, I do not know what percentage. I mean, they were extremely anxious and stressed before. Litigation is stressful, no matter what it's about, um, for everyone but lawyers. Um, and so I don't know what percentage, but they clearly had serious harm before the litigation. You never met with them before the litigation, did you? No. So you're testifying to that just like so many other things based on post-litigation conversations that you had? Um, it's not post because litigation is not over, but I spoke with a therapist who saw both of them. I listened to what he told me had been happening and how it was functioning at different points in time. And it made good reasonable patterns uh, that we know occur in medicine. And that's how it's present evaluation is generally done. Do you know um, that in on Father's Day 2017, Alex Jones um, issued a video invitation to the Sandy Hook parents to contact? 
No, I wasn't aware of that. So you don't know whether or not they ever received the message? But who received what message? The Sandy Hook parents ever received Alex Jones's message inviting them to contact him? I do not know. If they had heard him and they had contact him, do you think that that might have had a positive impact on their mental health to have worked through this with him? Um, I do not think so because I don't think that Alex Jones was going to apologize. He hasn't, to my knowledge, he hasn't apologized now for what he's done. Um, he's made multiple false statements, statements that have little basis in, no, really no basis in reality. Um, and I think that that would have, would have used that as a media, from everything that I've seen about him, he would have used that as another media opportunity. He'd be able to say, I spoke to the parents, and I'm speaking to them, I know. And this knowledge that you have of Alex Jones comes from watching the videos that we have in evidence in this case? Yes. Um, earlier you said that Owen Schroyer called Neil Heslin a liar. Do you recall that testimony? He said that it was not possible that um, Neil held his son um, within a day of uh, the tragedy. I'm sorry, that he, but that he, he did not hear. hold his son after the tragedy within one day of the tragedy. Because you know that, in fact, Mr. Heslin did hold his son the day of the tragedy, or that night at around 1.30 in the morning. I wasn't there. I haven't called up the uh, policeman. Um, that's not really the job of the forensic. Mm -hmm. And to get into that level of detail, um, <coughs> my first thought, I was surprised when Mr. Schroyer said that this is you know, not possible. But the first thing that came to my mind was, of course it's possible. Um, at some point, he may have stuck around and somebody may have let him, even though, you know, people were told that they couldn't, that somebody may have left him out of pity, out of compassion. So your belief when you watch the video is that Owen Schroyer's comment was directed at whether or not Mr. Heslin had held the body that day, or that night? It was directed at, I mean, that was, that the was gist a specific comment. Um, I mean, the, I think the underlying statement was that they're liars. Now, harassment is a crime, is it not? I believe so. Stalking is a crime? Yes. And um, you would agree with me that uh, it's not the defense's job to prove that the parents weren't harassed, is it? We're going into legal issues now, which are not part of psychiatry. You testified in 200 plus cases. You're probably pretty familiar with the burden of proof, aren't you? Your Honor, this way I would object to an improper expert opinion. I mean, there's a million things you could object to, and they're all the same. You testified that uh, Ms. Lewis said that she had a, uh, a state-of-the-art surveillance system? She has a significant, well, she has a, I don't know, state-of-the-art. Um, she has a very significant surveillance system, and her anxiety is such that she won't even use an air conditioner because she might not hear something. And she's had this surveillance system, security system, for a number of years? A few years. I don't know if they've been there. Now, um, since you took the time to review the um, videos, you know that there's less than 24, there's 23 hours and 39 minutes of video uh, that InfoWars released about Sandy Hook over the entire five year period. Isn't that true? I don't know the number of hours. No, I'm going to object. It's sustained. He does that, no, you asked a question that assumes facts that are not in evidence and misrepresents the testimony that we have had in this case so far. Does not. Excuse me? Should I move on? You had better. You testified you reviewed the videos? 
No, I saw some of the videos during this trial and, and therefore. Um, in 2016, um, did Neil Heslin or Scarlett Lewis ever tell you that in 2016, um, the Sandy Hook controversy was thrust into the public attention again by the Hillary Clinton campaign? We did discuss that. Um, did, uh, would it have been relevant to you if at the time that controversy had arisen, it had been 16 months since Mr. Jones had made any kind of a statement about Sandy Hook? Objection, Your Honor. It's misleading. And that's facts, not in evidence. <coughs> um, I'll sustain that. you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 31 in evidence. And I'm going to direct you to the second to last entry on that. Yes. It says, uh, it's for a video entitled The Fight for Freedom of Information in Sandy Hook. Is that correct? Yes. And the date on that video is July 8th, 2015? Yes. And the next entry states that the title of the video is Alex Jones' Final Statement on Sandy Hook? Yes. And the date of that video is November 18th, 2016? Yes. yes. Objection. He's doing the same thing. He's just trying to use Exhibit 31 as an exhaustive list, knowing that that's not all the videos. It's the only ones that they've produced to us or that we had to find. So the, the, the questions so far are allowed, but I don't know if the next one will be. So I take your point, Mr. Andre. Do you have any idea how many hours we've spent in trial discussing Sandy Hook so far? Objection relevance. It's the same. testified earlier that um, you disagreed with the idea of sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Would you concede that sometimes important speech can be viewed as offensive? Yes. touched on the psychiatric concept of malingering earlier. Do you recall that? Yes. Would you agree with the definition of malingering as the intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms motivated by external incentives? Yes. External incentives can be monetary. Yes. They can be social. Yes. And by social, I mean seeking approval. Yes. Seeking fame. Yes. Seeking meaning. I'm not sure what you mean by seeking meaning in this context. How about seeking revenge? Could be. You stated that you reviewed the depositions in this case? Yes. You reviewed Mr. Heslin's deposition? Yes. You saw where he says that he has a vendetta against Alex Jones? Yes. A ven vendetta is a blood feud, correct? Um, I don't know what he meant by the word. I didn't ask him about that word. And 
it would be very it was crucial to ask him what he means. Did you ask him what he meant by that word when you read it in his deposition? No. I took it to mean that he was very angry that uh, Alex Jones had done the things he had done and caused so much harm to um, himself and the mother of his child and also harm to uh, TJ. It's JT. JT. Um, you testified earlier that in the wake of a tragedy, people often look to find meaning in uh, the, the tragedy and the sorrow of the loss. And they seek to do something, to create something that they wouldn't have created without it. And, so and some benefit comes out of what's basically a horrible thing. And, and part of that is because nobody likes to think that something that awful would happen for no reason at all. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, that it happens for no reason, but they try to make to make something good from it. And would you agree that people sometimes can be influenced in the causes that they embrace uh, in the wake of a tragedy? It's too big, I don't understand the question. Well, is it possible that in the wake of a school shooting, um, a bereaved parent would take up the cause of gun control? in order to find meaning in the tragedy that they suffer. There are people who have done that at school shootings. And, and in fact, Mr. Heslin's one of them. I don't know. Uh, yes. yes. And um, somebody could seek to find meaning in uh, helping kids deal with emotional issues in school. True? Yes. And somebody could also find meaning in destroying Alex Jones. I'm not aware that Alex Jones was anything to them until, or of any significance even, until the continued um, vilification of um, Scarlett and Neil. Pass the words. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Lewis, I'm going to ask you a few questions about the questioning and answer that you earlier gave. It's very novel. First, I want to start off with Mr. Raynal asked you if you were aware whether or not Neil and Scarlett reached out to Mr. Jones so they could sit down and he could be a therapist to you for that? Um, I think he, I thought he said Jones reached out to them. Correct, and he and he asked you if they had taken him up on that. Remember that? Um, I'm not aware of them taking him up on it. Them taking him up on it. Are you aware that, the, that, that Neil and Scarlett did in fact reach out, did, did in fact communicate with Mr. Jones when they started with this lawsuit? I believe so, yes. Are you aware that prior to that they served him with uh, an offer for him to retract these statements and correct them, and he never did that. Did you know that? I am, yes, I'm aware of that. Did Alex Jones say, okay, now let's sit down and talk about it? Not that I'm aware of. I want to talk about important speech. How important is it for someone to lie about the murder of a bunch of six year olds? How important is that speech? Well, it, it, it goes beyond not being important. Um, you, going back to my PhD in political science, you can't have a democracy in which there are lies floating around and people are telling different truths. You can have a democracy where people have different opinions, but not different facts. That tears the place apart. How so it's hardly destructive to do that. Similar question, how important is it for an individual to intentionally inflict emotional distress on two parents who've lost a son for, t for the better part of 10 years? How important is that? Well, it's important for the person who does it because it generally will make them a lot of money if they're on TV. But it's not going, but it's not to the benefit of society in any way. 
Were you in the courtroom when Ms. Lewis testified on Friday? Yes. Did you hear her testimony when she said that the video was about Sandy Hook and the vampires was Alex Jones' third most read article he could ever publish in the history of this company? It was one of the most published, yes, at the top of the list. Mr. Rain, I'll ask you about how three billion people saw this content that Mr. Jones was spewing to the world. When Ms. Lewis said that number, did she say three billion people or did she say three billion views? Oh, yes, she's talked about it very clearly, three billion views, that she didn't know how many times, how many different people did it or how many um, were reviewing as opposed to separate individuals. It is a staggering number either way, but it's, it's much more believable if it was uh, three billion views. Is that a new exhibit? Yes, Your Honor. So a new exhibit would be 119. I think it's 119. Okay. Let me just double check that a little bit. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, you must have numbered some we haven't seen. So there's, I'm, the last one I have is 126. So 127. Thank you, Your Honor. And is it okay if I sticker it properly? She has stickers. Oh. Dr. Lubick, uh, I've just handed you a copy of what's marked as exhibit one, uh, plaintiff's, plaintiff's Exhibit 126. 127. 127. What is Exhibit 127 without telling us the contents of the document? Affidavit of Neil Heslin. And prior to your testimony today, had you reviewed that document? I don't specifically recall it. I may have or may not have. I'm not sure. Take a moment and read what's in it. See if that refreshes your recollection on whether or not you see it. I have seen this before. And this is part of the materials that you relied on in coming to the opinions you provided earlier today. Yes. Your Honor, please offer Exhibit 127 of evidence. Any objection? Yes, sir, Your Honor. Do you want a copy for me? Yes, Your Honor. May I approach? Yes. So he certainly can rely on it, no doubt, can talk about it, but I don't know about it coming into evidence as a standalone document. So where do you think that's in the rules? Your Honor, instead of admitting it, I can withdraw my admission and we can just disclose it. The, we can put it up on the screen and go through it without actually admitting it. Well, he can talk about it. Okay. And he can talk about everything in it if he relied on it as part of developing his expert opinion. Sure. But you can't show it to the jury unless it's admitted. Okay. Okay. But yeah, he can absolutely talk about he can talk about the whole thing. Dr. Lubick, when you were being when you were answering questions earlier, you were asked about timelines and if anything had been seen before two thousand eighteen. Now that you've reviewed the doc this document, except the or excuse me, what was marked as one twenty seven. Can you tell me what how that affected the fact that 
Mr. Heslin had seen and was aware of the content of the hoax prior to 2018? He was avoiding it. Um, he did not want to be drawn in. Um, and it's notable to me that uh, he didn't approach Megan Kelly, Megan Kelly approached him. To, to avoid getting drawn into a hoax, do you have to know it exists? Yes. How long, or was there a long period of time that Mr. Heslin proactively sought to avoid getting pulled into the hoax yes. in these conspiracies? Yes. What, are we talking days, months, or years? Years, until he finally spoke He agreed to go on Megan Kelly and after asked um, in 2017, uh, roughly five years after, uh, to hopefully stop you know, the, the lies and you know, hoping it would stop things. Instead, the opposite happened. Go up to section two. After reviewing section two, are you aware that Mr. Heslin was aware that the hoax that he was avoiding was being spread by Alex Jones? Um, yes. And when did the hoax start? When did Mr. Jones start this? My recollection is there was very shortly after, within days. Mr. Raynaud was asking questions about 2018 and saying they never saw anything before. They didn't know anything about Alex Jones. Do you remember that? Um, I don't specifically recall him saying that, but they did know about it before. Why would, Ms. Why would Mr. Heslin go on a Megyn Kelly show to refute Mr. Jones's claims in 2017 if he didn't know any of those hoax claims existed until a year ago? That wouldn't make any sense. Well, unless Megyn Kelly had called him up and told him, but he knew before. And he probably wouldn't have gone on unless he knew it was a pro real problem. When someone lies about you, do you have to physically hear that person say it for it to harm you? Oh, of course not. It, it, however you hear it, you get it secondhand from people, that's even worse in some ways. You know, if someone lies to your face about you, it's, it's painful, it hurts, but if you hear that someone's passing around rumors about you, and so that many people are now thinking this, that's worse. Did Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis have to watch an Alex Jones show and hear the lies for them to be harmed? No, not at all. Again, if you know that rumors being passed around, it's worse than just one person saying something. It's, would you say it's even more worse when they're not just rumors, but people are physically encountering you of course. and harassing you about those messages? Of course, yes. Corroboration was talked about a lot. Remember that? Yes. You spoke with Mr. Crouch, correct? Yes. He's right here in the courtroom. He's coming up next, right? Yes. We're not going to hide him. Correct. Everything that Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis communicated to you, did you then go and corroborate it with somebody who documented it as it was happening? Yes, I did do just that with Mr. Crouch. And I saw a number of tapes myself of what Mr. Jones was saying. The other, the, the last area I have is <clears throat> in you testified in cases before, and sometimes are there other experts that represent the party that didn't hire you? Almost all the time. I don't know if I can even think of a case where there wasn't an expert hired by the other side. And when that happens, you review their materials and what their testimony so that you can compare what yours looks like, right? Yes. Are you aware of any expert 
whatsoever um, that represent or that was hired by the defense that's going to testify in this case? Yeah, I object to this line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Argan knows very well why that's the case. And it has nothing to do with this witness. I'm going to respond to that. I'm not sure how his conduct can be rewarded by me not getting to ask these questions that are, are admissible otherwise. I don't see how you can get rewarded for that. I, it's not part of his expert testimony. It's what usually happens. All right, I'm, I'm going to overrule the objection. I don't want to spend forever on it, but you can answer the question. To your knowledge, does Mr. Jones or his company, are they bringing an expert in? No. In mental health whatsoever? I would have hoped to be given the uh, a report by them if they were testifying, if, if someone had that report. Thank you, Dr. Lubin. I'll have more Mr. Renault? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Um, this time, uh, for my jury, you know the drill. Remember, as always, all of my instructions. This is an individual exercise. You're not encouraged. You're just permitted. Um, and we'll take it. Let's keep it a short break because we've only been back 40 minutes. All right. You can go ahead and head back now. Thank you. All rise. Um, in fact, we don't have to wait until we call you back. But let the jury get back into their room before you head on out there. And if you'll just shut that door for me. Thank you. All right, you may be seated. Um, so like I guess I do you can wait in the hall. Um, you should have, there should be a copy one, I think only one, if you want some more, let me know, of the charge so far on each table. Okay. Um, so you can take a look at that. Uh, Your Honor? Yeah. Just to not disrupt the proceedings, I'm going to have to make that same motion again after talking with it. So I don't know if you want me to, how you want to handle that. I think you should stop me. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Put it on the record. Well, I, I would move now for a mistrial um, under CPRC 4111. Okay, that's denied. Thank you. I have just some very briefly. Okay. Um, I'd like to, to raise an objection right now to, to whatever your owner wants to do about it. I'm not moving for a mistrial. But I'm very concerned uh, about a series of things that have just happened. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that everybody in the room is on the same page. Mr. Raynaud had told the jury that there was 29 minutes total of indoor videos. He played it. 51 minutes in a single video, so we know that's not true. It tried to tell the jury about Ms. Ms. Lewis's testimony about 3, million, 3 billion page views that she had testified that it was 3 million individuals, which she explicitly said was not and could not be determined, and in fact were people returning multiple times, attempted to mislead the witness into thinking that's what she was saying. He has routinely, every single day of this trial, broken rules that a first year lawyer knows. He has routinely placed inadmissible material in front of the jury, it is from our perspective at this table that Mr. Raynell is actively trying for a mistrial. And obviously, we don't want that to happen. Um, we, we would hope that at this point we could have Mr. Raynell instructed to please follow rules, which we all know he very well knows, uh, and to not attempt to sabotage what has happened to the plans. Otherwise, I want this on the record and why I'm bringing it to you now, because we will be bringing additional motions for sanctions if this continued conduct continues. All right. Um, I am very upset that you have tried to imply to the jury that we know how many videos about Sandy Hook were released by your clients when we don't because they refused to respond to discovery. So I do not want you to do that again. And, and I don't want you to argue with me about it. That is the rule of this case. That is the, that's it. They didn't respond, we don't know. So don't couch it in that language. Your Honor, if I may. I'm still talking. I'm not really being asked to do anything except tell you to follow rules, which I feel like I've done many times already. We've had multiple conversations about how I know you know what the rules are, and you know you know what the rules are, but you've chosen not to follow them on occasion. And I'm asking you again, follow the rules, we are not going to take up sanctions in the middle of this trial. So if somebody wants to file a motion for sanctions, we'll take it up at the conclusion of the trial. If I 
believe actions in front of me rise to the level of contempt of court, I will deal with that when it happens. Had I been in the room the day there was altercation, we would be in that situation, but I was not. Uh, Your Honor, the jury instructions that you just distributed said that the jury has to base its decision on the evidence adduced in the courtroom. Frankly, uh, the the number of videos, their length, this is evidence that is being induced in yes, the courtroom. Yes, but what you said was not, we've shown the jury 29 minutes of clips where the word Sandy Hook appears or anything like that. It was, they released in total 29 minutes. That is not true. Okay, I, I can change the question. So don't, way. well, I'm not going to tell you what question to ask, because that is definitely not my job, but I'm telling you what question not to ask. Very well. Anything else? Not from us on your own. All right. Oh, good, because I don't think I brought my, I don't know where my badge is. All rise. I don't know where my badge is. Sorry. Anyhow, I don't know how I
Thank you. You can sit down. Off the record. How many years have you been? Wait, is the doctor out of the room? Yes. He's yes, working. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. How many years have you been treating Mr. Heslin and Mrs. Lewis? Get that cleared up. Uh, I started treating. <laughs> <laughs> These are questions the jury has. This is not for you, you, sir. Ah, ah, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I want, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Lubit is out in the hall, right? That's correct. Okay, okay, good. All right. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, sir, but your turn's later. All right. Um, I don't think I'm going to ask either of these questions, but I'll read them so you can hear them. Alex Jones has helped promote the idea that Sandy Hook was a staged event with crisis actors to do away with our guns. However... As per your own testimony, Scarlett Lewis keeps a gun for her own self-protection. What are your thoughts on the irony of that comparison? This is not a proper question for a variety of reasons, so I'm not going to ask it. Would Alex Jones' personal and public apology be more effective in helping Neil and Scarlett heal and recover from their mental anguish than any monetary compensation from him? I think it's probably a fair question. We can, we can come back to it if you have an objection. In your professional opinion, do you think it was healthy for Mrs. Lewis to take up arms after the safe? This is Shady Hooks. Sandy, no, I don't. Sandy Hook, right? Sandy yes, Hook. Incident. If so, why? To your knowledge, did Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis feel as though a quarter of the population distrusted them? There's a lot of Neil and Scarlet's general placing. Have Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis discuss with you what good they would like to do or come from the tragedy at Sandy Hook. How do you think orchestrated campaigns of lies such as we've seen in this case are affecting our society? What are the signs that a person might be malingering? If the statements from InfoWars stopped today, how long do you think it would take for the healing to occur? Is it possible that forensic psychologists, academic researchers, news editors at all are able to set aside their own potential bias in their search for the truth in the same way that this jury is asked to? In your opinion, why would it be more important for a news organization to verify its claims and conduct investigations than a forensic psychologist? I don't, I don't know that he testified to that, but did your work with Mr. Posner involve the same defendants? And I don't know if there's ongoing work there or if they're referencing something prior, so it might be a problem there. All right. How many years have you been treating Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis? And that's fine. Would Alex Jones' personal and public apology be more effective in helping Neil and Scarlett heal and recover from their mental anguish than any monetary compensation from him? I don't think this is a proper question. We cannot order an apology. That's not what our judicial system does. It monetizes arms, and I don't know that he would know the answer anyway. So I don't think that's a proper question. So he didn't argue with me. In your professional opinion, do you think it was healthy for Ms. Lewis to take up arms? That's literally what it says, take up arms after the Sandy Hook incident. If so, why? I don't know that she didn't have a gun before then. I, I was just going to say, I think that gun control and the effect of lies on society are probably not appropriate matters for him to find on. I agree, Your Honor. 
So is, are you saying you don't, this is a proper question? I'm a little confused. Yes, okay. That's fine with me because I find it a little confusing. To your knowledge, did Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis feel as though a quarter of the population distrusted them? That seems okay. Have Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis discussed with you what good they would like to do or come from the tragedy at Sandy Hook? Any objections? Just to the extent that we have a, a motion in limine, and I think that there was already a statement about uh, giving all the money to charity. I think that they already. There was no statement. He just no. said. Sorry. He, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say my, my objection would be that that seems like the kind of question that may elicit that type of an answer, and we've already heard that that's not an issue in this case, so I just want to bring it to the court's attention. I think it goes towards punitives, Your Honor. I'm sorry? I think it goes towards punitives, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, we have the motion of limine that says uh, you basically can't, Put on evidence that they're planning to start a charity, right? We have that. Um, I think we have testimony from this witness that says people, and I think you elicited this. They strike up, you know, they 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 care about things that maybe they didn't care as much about before, right? Like uh, what's it called? Jesus. Social. I can't remember what's called. But anyway, the stuff they do with schools and or gun control. Um, I, I think it's probably open at this stage. I don't know what he'll say. Are you worried? No, we're okay. All right. We'll ask it. How do you think orchestrated campaigns of lies, such as we've seen in this case, are affecting our society? We object to that, and I think we're trying to see you. Okay. What are the signs that a person might be malingering? If the statements from InfoWars stop today, how long do you think it would take for the healing to occur? I mean, I feel like this is kind of within the testimony he's been giving the jury about. I think it'll be all right. Yeah, I have an objection? Has, you know, okay. Yeah, we have no objection. I think that's a fair question for this witness. Is it possible that forensic psychologists, academic researchers, news editors at all are able to set aside their own potential bias in their search for the truth in the same way that this jury is asked to? I don't know. I don't have a strong feeling about it. I don't like it. It's not one that I would wonder why no one was objecting but it's not necessarily one I wouldn't exclude either. That's <laughs> kind of in the middle, so. I don't have a problem with it. But I think it'll depend on if anyone objects. Okay with the question, Your Honor. All right. In your opinion, why would it be more important for a news organization to verify its claims and conduct investigations than a forensic psychologist? I mean, to the extent that he testified to that, which he didn't, but I think he'll be able to clarify. I think he's talked around that, so I'm okay with that if you, are, if you guys are. All right. Um, did your work with Mr. Posner involve the same defendants? I don't know what difference it makes, but I think it's a fair question. We're already talking about it. Do you have an objection? The, the only thing I would mention is I've, because of your email, I've, I've specifically instructed the witness not to, to mention his other Posner info or suit. So I would because of your what? I'm sorry. We have another. He is also the expert in Posner, the opinion before you. Oh. And okay. because of your email, I've specifically instructed him not to talk about that. And so, but um, he was asked about Mr. Reynal asked him about. He has another one too. A, another different. There case. was a, a a small suit against Mr. Fetzer in Wisconsin as well that concluded with a with a modest verdict. So do we want to say? Um, but I'm just worried because I think he's not going to. Sure, gonna sure. So it. what if I think that was the last question? Let me find it. Um, and I agree. We don't want to. So we we might want to say, did your testimony? With Mr. Posner or in Mr. Posner's case? Because didn't he already testify? Well, that what that if you could say in your case against Mr. Fetzer. Well, no, the that jury doesn't know anything about that. This no. is from the jury. Sure. I mean, I, I'd be fine if it as long as I could tell him you, you're you not bound by not having to be able to talk about Posner case in this court. Um, then he can answer the question. Otherwise, I think he's going to get crossed sideways because he isn't going to be able to talk about, yes, I am involved with Mr. Posner at the same time. Because he thinks he can't talk about that. I told him not to. But I, the, the only thing they know is that he 
didn't he testify? That he testified for free for but the he's truth. He's done work for other. <laughs> right. Right. In a case that involved Mr. Fosner, and I think that so that's the only thing the jury knows. So that's what they're talking about. I don't know. Let's well, just not ask it. It's too confusing. Right. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Anybody need to hear them again? No, let's go on the record. We've just been discussing the questions for Dr. Lubit, uh, and we've reached an agreement on which ones we're going to ask and which ones are not. Any further objections, uh, Mr. Ogden? No, Your Honor. Mr. Reynolds? No, Your Honor. Okay. We are ready for the jury and the witness. Submitted by the jury, you just answer them as if they came from one of the lawyers. Just listen really hard to the question, answer the question as best you understand it, or let us know if you don't. This is for the jury. Remember, if you don't hear your question, that's because um, I made a decision that there was a reason why I couldn't read it. Okay? You ready? Yes, ma'am. How many years have you been treating Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis? Um, I, I have never treated Ms. Lewis or um, Mr. Heslin. I did a forensic evaluation, and there's no doctor-patient relationship, and I will not be treating them again. I won't be interviewing them at any other time. To your knowledge, did Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis feel, feel as though a quarter of the population distrusted them? Um, I believe so, that there was, especially Neil talked about just how many people out there uh, you know, and he ne would never know who, and people would come up to him. And um, also, uh, Scarlett withdrew from people not knowing you know, among her friends who, what people thought anymore, who she had people over who might be part of, not be feeling that she was a fake and a fraud too. Have Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis discussed with you what good they would like to do or come from the tragedy at Sandy Hook? Um, Scarlett has talked, uh, there's her foundation, Choose Love, and trying to develop social emotional learning programs in schools and to help children so that there isn't another um, Sandy Hook. Both of them have talked about the tremendous harm that uh, this the type of behavior that Mr. Jones is engaged in does to people, and hope that you know their succeeding in the trial will dissuade people in the future. There's also the issue of their son's legacy, um, and wanting that to be clear, and for them to be able to try to put some closure on this 
period in which they were uh, invalidated and, and vilified. And so many people were made to believe that uh, they were bad people who lied and did bad things. What are the signs that a person might be malingering? Um, that's something I'll write out. What we do as a psychiatrist, psychologist too, is to look at the pattern of, of the problem. So we look at you know, what was the cause of the, of the emotional trauma. Uh, does it make sense that this cause could lead to a lot of symptoms? Does the pattern of symptoms make sense? So, and often people give strange patterns or they repeat over and over again just how terrible it was for them. No matter what question you ask, they just go jump back and say how terrible it was. They pushing the idea too much. Um, there's talking to people at different times, which is something I did here, um, and seeing if people give the same answers. Uh, it's if someone is telling the truth, they probably they're going to say the same thing. Uh, or almost the same thing at two different points in time. You separate the interviews out, they're likely not going to remember what they said. They're not, really not, they're not taking notes on my questions. And then uh, a few months later, they're gonna say something different, very likely. So all those things are looked at. I look at their emotions when speaking to me and it's consistent. Um, you know, in one situation, I a girl was claiming that she had been sexually abused and she was completely comfortable. The way she looked, and I asked her how you're feeling. She said, oh, I'm fine. For a 12, 13 year old girl to be told, telling a male stranger that she had been raped is unlikely. And so that raised serious questions for me about what had actually happened. Sorry. That's all right. Is everything okay? Oh, it's my phone calling. Oh, okay. okay. You can pick it up. Oh, sorry. At the end, it will fall down. All right. Um, if the statements from InfoWars stop today, how long do you think it would take for the healing to occur? I think it's going to, it takes more than just the statements to stop. Um, when we've been, when people are injured, or think about our own feelings, responses to things. If someone stops doing something bad to us, hurtful to us, that's usually not enough. We need vindication, we need statements that this should not have happened, the person should not have done it, and it was a bad thing that they did to us, and that would help the healing. Are they ever going to fully heal? I don't think so. This is a really traumatic situation. And, you know, I used the word complex trauma before. When traumas are repeated incidents instead of just one. And complex trauma, particularly damaging, is the ability to trust people in general. And that's very destructive to relationships, to work, to everything. And complex trauma is much harder to heal than a single incident trauma. Is it possible that forensic psychologists, academic researchers, news editors at all are able to set aside their own potential bias in their search for the truth in the same way that this jury is asked to? We have to be careful about it. And I've written an article just on overwhelmingly focused on bias. I was addressed again in the articles I'm writing now. And it's important, very important to do one's best to do that. And it depends what we're talking about. When I when I'm basically asked general questions and I'm quoting myself from things that I've written um, in, you know, before I got involved, I think that's fairly unbiased. It's not in any way based on the trial. Um, I don't think it's biased for me to say that they have post-traumatic stress disorder because they, there's a list of specific symptoms and they have enough symptoms, they meet the criteria. Um, I, I've i seen people, you know, ignore data uh, or spin data heavily. I try very hard never to do that. You can really minimize the risk of, of bias if you present to yourself competing hypotheses about what happened, then you look and see how the data fit each, and I try to do that in every case rather than looking for data that just supports what your gut instinct says is true. In your opinion, why would it be more important for a news organization to verify its claims and conduct investigations than a forensic psychologist? 
Um, it's simply not, it's not practical. Uh, it takes, it takes a huge number of man hours to go back and check on each fact. And you have people on each side of the case, and if the facts, as you believe them, are not correct, they were the ones who to be doing the research and saying, wait a minute. But so we do our best to to, to look at um, different reports we have, such as again, Mr. Crouch, um, who lived this all the way along, myself, uh, interviewing him on multiple occasions, the his emotions and the trauma and the symptoms he has fitting together, and those pieces are what we use in forensic psychiatry is, is showing that um, that we feel the person is more like credible than not. Um, and all the pieces fit well together. Everything that I do as a forensic psychiatrist indicates to me that I'm being told the truth. Um, and I often felt that I wasn't being told the truth, but in this case, I did. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Lubitz, for your time and your testimony. At this time, you're free to uh, return to whatever it is you need to be doing, whether that's in here or somewhere else. Don't forget your phone. All right, uh, and who, well, who is our next witness? I just call Michael Crouch. All right. Mr. Crouch, come on up, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm, under penalty of perjury, that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth? the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much. Can you have a seat? Here, you'll see there's water and glasses um, and microphones. Thank you. I can't tell if you are also a little bit soft-spoken. Um, if you are, you'll have to just scoot the chair up a little bit closer. Did you hear my instructions about letting the attorney completely finish their question and all of that? All right, then I'll, I'll try. I, I tend to repeat it every single time, but I'll give you a chance. We'll see how it goes. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Good morning. Or good afternoon, I guess. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Michael Crouch. How are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm okay. I'm a little nervous. Are you, um, you've never testified, or is it one of a long time ago, is that right? Maybe 25 plus years ago, yeah. That's the only other time you've ever taken a way to stand for. That's right. Tell me what you do for a living. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist. What's a psychotherapist? So I, uh, I work with patients and couples who struggle with depression, anxiety disorders, trauma, that kind of stuff. Where do you live? Uh, I live in Norwalk, Connecticut. How long have you been a psychotherapist? Uh, 31 years. Is that, a, is that something you get licensed for? It is. Can I am licensed in the state of Connecticut. Can you walk me through um, the, the education that's required to be Psychotherapist. Yeah, I have an undergraduate in psychology, and then I graduated with a master's in social work from Columbia University in 1991. You and I have had an uh, opportunity to spend a little time together this weekend and, and talk about some of the care that you had in New York Scarlet, right? Yes. All right, so I know a few things about you. There was a gap between undergrad and when you went to Columbia. Tell us about that. Um, well, my first career, and then what brought me from uh, Kansas to connect to New York City was I had a, about 15, 16 years in uh, theater, musical theater. You were uh, working on trying to, trying to become a star. <laughs> you, I was. <laughs> <laughs> when I realized that wasn't going to happen, I, uh, uh, I moved on. You started taking care of people. I did. And they're both, they're both listening businesses. Um, I, I'll just get this out of the way. We're not well, let me tell you, we're compensating you for your time, right? We are. Yes, we are. You know, if, I, if I remember right, it's just whatever amount that you would, you're, you're out from a day's practice that you had. Right? That's correct. So you didn't charge me for even being here this weekend, even though you were here this weekend, right? No, I did not. It's, it's important for you to be here, for you, right? It's really important for me to be here. It's part of my work. Part of your care. Yes. There's a, there's something we were talking about called the Trauma Recovery Network. Can you tell mm -hmm. the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that is? Yeah, back in uh, 2011, there was a Christmas Day fire in Stamford, Connecticut, where 70 firefighters were involved both in the 
uh, rescue operations attempts and the recovery operation. And there were three children who died and their grandparents. This was a house fire? This was a house fire. Do you remember what happened? Um, from what I was told, um, that there were, that they had a fire in the fireplace, and one of the twins, uh, there were twin daughters who were seven and then a nine-year-old daughter, uh, said Santa Claus won't be able to get down the chimney. So uh, the boyfriend who uh, cleared out the fireplace of all of the ashes and put him in breezeway outside, and that breezeway caught fire. How did you get involved in, in, in that? Um, that on Christmas Day, um, there was a mix-up in the um, EAP w with the city of Stamford EAP uh, employee assistance program, and so um, there was no response. And the my understanding is that the the mental health other mental health providers said we don't come out on weekends or holidays. <laughs> So when you say no response, you, you mean no response by middle health professionals? That's correct. Okay. And there were seventy firefighters involved in that fire who needed some help, who were struggling with that. Now the loss of a child is always difficult. For the first responders to see you. Yes. So and I just want to make sure we're clear, you were called out to talk with the seventy firefighters that had to deal with either trying to fight the fire or when you say recovery efforts. Recover, recover both the children and their grandparents. At, at this time, there was no trauma recovery network in Connecticut, is that right? That's correct. There were only three at that time, New York City, Western Massachusetts, and Arizona. So how did this 2011 Christmas fire at Stanford become a trauma recovery network? Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I got a call from a therapist who said, Michael, did you hear what happened? And I said no, and her husband was a captain on the fire department, and she said there was a Christmas fire, and uh, there's no mental health coverage. So uh, I went the next day, which was Monday, I think, to talk to the assistant chief, and find out what they were going to do. Um, and they were going to have a debriefing the next day, and so I, I called three a therapist that I knew, EMDR therapist that I knew, uh, EMDR eye movement desensitization reprocessing, been around since late 80s. Okay. okay. So I called three, and all three of them said yes, and they were there the next day uh, during the debriefing. And then uh, Karen Alter Reed, who is one of the co coordinators of the Trauma Recovery Network, uh, said, You should start a TRN. So I did, <laughs> All right. not knowing what I was getting into. And have you been involved in that TRN since that late 2011? Uh, yes. Uh, you and your team helped treat those firefighters for what they were doing. Uh, yes, we did. Okay. We, and we were Stanford Fire uh, TRN, and then Newtown happened a year later. All right, so a year later, this TRN, this trauma recovery network's already set up in place, right? That's correct. How does it get involved with what happened at the San Diego Elementary School? Uh, we went the next day, which I believe was Saturday morning, just to talk to the other psychotherapists in the Newtown area about what they were going through. When you say we, how, how many did your team got to be at that time? Uh, at that time, there, there were only 10 of us. Okay. Uh, some full-time, some part-time? Uh, all were full-time at that time. Is it, what didn't, it, it, just correct me if I'm wrong, it's not that you just treated folks whenever there was some major event. Even just officers on sort of their day to day had a tough day with some traffic stop, things like that? Yeah, anytime there are uh, duty induced uh, issues or family issues or they're struggling with depression, anxiety, uh, they can call us. So you're helping the first responders cope with what they do? With what they do, that's correct. Um, I know you treated Neil and Scarlett, we're going to get to that in one second, but just the other work at San Diego, how many folks did your TRN treat for mental health problems that they had from that? Oh, my guess is between two and 250. You treated a handful yourself. I, I sure did. Okay. Both uh, individually I treated 
about six, and then uh, a number of groups and things like that that we were involved in. And I think you told me that's how Neil Hessen ended up finding you, right? That's correct. All right. When did you first start treating Neil Hessen? Uh, in July of 2013. So about seven, seven and a half months after mm -hmm. you uh, Are you still treating him? I am. So he's been your patient ever since, right? That's correct. We're going to talk about Scarlett, too. Scarlett didn't start with you back in 2013, right? No. Um, she had been through a number of different therapists and, and came to me, I think at Neil's suggestion, around 2020. Did, uh, you're not still treating Scarlett, though, right? I'm not. Do you know how many times you um, treated Scarlett? I saw her about 10 times. Was this during, so 2020, is this during the pandemic, so your treatment is Zoom? That's good, correct. I use uh, a platform called Simple Practice. Okay. Because it's HIPAA compliant. Fair enough. But it's, you never got a chance to really sit down and, and, and be in the same room and connect with Scarlett? No, I did not. It's probably a silly question. You, you keep notes in your sessions, right? Okay. And um, as part of your um, sort of weekend assignment, did you look at those notes and try to refresh your recollection? I did, yes. You also looked at the affidavit of Neil Heston that we talked about with Dr. Luther, is that right? I did. When you looked at your notes of your, is it sessions or treatment? <coughs> with, with the Whatever, sessions. Sessions, okay. good, yeah. With Mr. Let's talk about Mr. Heston first, and then we'll move to Scarlett. When you talked, of, when you look back at your notes with Mr. Heslin, when is the first time you saw in your notes some issue about either Alex Jones or people profiting off of what happened at Sandy Hook? Uh, way back in 2013, when I first started with Neil, uh, he said that there are uh, a number of people who are profit, profiting off of what happened at his son's schools. And then he went on to say there are a number of people who are profiting off the loss of children. That was in 2013. When was the first time you, that, I'm just going to ask you this, did that intensify as the years went, that went along? Um, a little bit, in that he was um, uh, certainly scared a little bit of what was going on. He was... Um, dedicated to uh, the memory of his son so he and he uh, he worked on gun control and mental health issues uh, to honor his son Jesse did you see where mr. Heston had said if he was trying to distance himself from that hoax controversy for the first several years for the first several years he said I, I don't want to dignify any that was the first time he used the, the, uh, Mr. Jones's name, Alex Jones, he said, I don't want to dignify uh, his false claims. The hoax. The hoax, that's correct. And so that was in, again, in 2013, um, he said that. Okay. Did it intensify in early 2018? Um, yes. Actually, that was the first time that he realized because he, t he spoke to Mr. Posner and he said, uh, Mr. Posner said, Neil, they are using your name back in 2017 when he went on Megyn Kelly. After the first time you saw the words, actually the words Alex Jones in your notes, what percentage of your notes thereafter had the word Alex Jones in it? 90%. It became an obsession? Yes. I'm going to talk to you. We're going to try to separate sort of two parts of time. I want to talk to you about before that 2018 when, when Alex Jones was really intense and then after, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about before. Um, and I know as you started treating him seven months, just walk me through, how, how is he doing as the years go by? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, whenever we lose a child, it's, it's not easy, ever. But you could see the narrative changing when it first happened, there was kind of scatter shock and trauma. Scatter. What do you mean by scatter shock? Meaning that he remembered all the bad things that had happened. Okay. You know, and that he was not able to protect his son. How was um, 
things like you know, the, in the first six, eight months you treated them, is sleep. Um, sleep was better than it was right after the murder. Um, but he's he was only getting two to four hours of sleep a night. As the years start going on, do you start to see improvements in sleep? I do. I, I did. Oh, I <coughs> heard. Can you speak up a little bit, Mr. Yeah, Rivera? I'm, I'm sorry, you're kind of quiet, and I'm having a hard time hearing your questions. I think I heard Dr. Lupitz say that you never get over the loss of a child. Do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. Do you get better? You can't find a place to put that loss. Was he doing that? Was he getting better? He was getting better in that he was beginning to remember all the things that he did with Jesse. And all the, um, all the things that, that brought joy to him. He was starting to have positive memories of Jesse. That That's right? correct. Before, you know, right after the murder, were the feelings much more negative? And just always remembering the murder. As well, well, remembering the murder, remembering the fact that he in fact dropped off his son and that he didn't, he believed he didn't do enough to protect him. Did he start finding enjoyment in life? Boy, oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, he found, yes, he was able to find a way to return to work. He was able to find a way, uh, he was sleeping a little better. He was able to to find a way to remember, have positive memories of Jesse is and, that, and is that his relationship with him. Is that clinically significant to find to, to start having these positive memories of your son? Yes, Explain it that. is. Well, in in EMDR, we, we talk about how distressing is that memory, how distressing uh, 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 is what you remember about your son and, and how he died. And at that time, it was from one to, from zero to 10, you know, it was a 22. It was, it was hard for him. Um, and it, it, it you could see it decreasing maybe to an eight, a seven. So he was beginning to have positive memories, beginning to return to work, uh, sleeping two to four hours, which is a little better. So those are things that would be significant. The healing process is underway, is that fair to say? That is fair to say. When you first see his, the Alex Jones name in 2018, Tell me what tell me what happens differently, Mr. Hessen. Um, when you talk about obsession, you could see that all of a sudden there was a closing down. There was a focus on I've got to protect my son's legacy, my son's honor, my son's memory. How was he doing that? Um, well, he went on Megan Kelly in 2017 and said, "Please stop." In your in your professional opinion. Why did he go on Megan Kelly? He was hoping that if he begged and pleaded, that Alex Jones would stop. Do you remember what his message to Alex Jones was at the end of that? Yeah, he said, um, you, have, you have a family, you have a son, or children. Um, enjoy Father's Day. He said, I, I can't. I don't have a son anymore. So I can't enjoy Father's Day, but I want you to enjoy Father's Day. He's compassionate. Very. And that was both, his. Both, Ali, I'm sorry. Both Neil Heslin and, and Scarlett Lewis are very good people, compassionate people. The enjoy Father's Day because I can't. Do you understand that to be his message to Alex Jones that my son Jesse was real? I, yeah, and he was. You know, I, I, it's technicality. He held Jesse, I think, at one o'clock in the morning. The day of the shooting, you know, the shooting was at nine, between nine o four and ten o'clock. Um, so he held his son because he asked a law enforcement officer, "Please let me in to see my son," and the law enforcement officer allowed him to do that. After he talks to Mr. Posner in 2018, you, you continue to treat him all the way up until he's, he's still your patient, right? He is. I'm sorry, I admit that when Mr. after Mr. Heslin spoke with Mr. Posner in 2018, you understand okay. that? Okay. Um, 
I, I want, if you can, to describe to the jury the differences in Neil's mental health after the 2018 When he realized that Alex Jones was not stopping, um, he became very focused on, I've got to protect, which is what all parents do, I've got to protect my son. I've got to protect my son's name, my son's honor, uh, his memory. Because if, if Alex Jones, if he was spreading the, the, the belief, the lies that, um, that Neil's an actor, that means that, that means that Jesse didn't exist, which is crazy. And that means if, if Jesse didn't exist, if Newtown didn't happen, the Sandy Hook shooting didn't happen, then, um, then he, what he knows about his son uh, is, is false. That's crazy. Jesse was a hero. Jesse, he saved lives. How do you save lives? Um, he yelled rum when Adam Lanza ran out of ammunition and was reloading. Jesse said rum. Kids got out. And kids got out. And there are kids who are now turning 16 that wouldn't be alive today if he didn't yell run. He was six. He was six years old. But that's what, what Scarlett and Neil taught him. Don't, you know, we don't quit until the job's over. <laughs> right. And Alex Jones was trying to, when he said it doesn't exist, he's stealing that from Neil. Right? That's correct. Stealing a belief that, and, and a knowledge that, because this was told to Neil, my understanding is it was told to Neil by kids who got out. Jesse saved our lives. He, he said, Ron. So, yes, you're taking away from Neil and Scarlett what they know of their son, what they want to hold on to. How did, they, how did that affect Neil's well-being? What did he start doing? In 2018, yes, sir. Um, he, he, when he realized that Alex Jones was not going to stop, he said, "Okay, the next, the next step is to, is to sue him for defamation of character." He he got he went to um, Mr. Posner and he said, "Why why do I are people um, why do I keep getting death threats? Why do I keep getting people?" Uh, calling me and talking to me. And Mr. Posner said, he mentioned your name a year ago, Neil. And Neil didn't know that because he didn't want to dignify what uh, Alex Jones was saying. I want to run that piece and have you watch it if that's okay. Sure. It's plaintiff's exhibit PX, PVX 23. <coughs> Now, here's another story. You know, I don't even know if Alex knows about this, to be honest with you. <laughs> Alex, if you're listening and you want to, uh, or if you just want to know what's going on, Zero Hedge has just published a story. Megyn Kelly fails to fact check Sandy Hook's Sandy Hook father's contradictory claim in Alex Jones' hit piece. Now, again, this, this broke... I think it broke today, I don't know what time, but featured in Megyn Kelly's expose, Neil Heslin, a father of one of the victims, during the interview described what happened the day of the shooting, and basically what he said, the statement he made, fact checkers on this have said cannot be accurate. He's claiming that he held his son and saw the bullet hole in his head. That is his claim. Now, according to a timeline of events and a coroner's testimony, 
That is not possible. And so one must look at Megyn Kelly and say, Megyn, I think it's time for you to explain this contradiction in the narrative. Because this is only going to fuel the conspiracy theory that you're trying to put out, in fact. So, and here's the thing, too. You would remember, let me see how long these clips are. You would remember if you held your dead kid in, in your hands with a bullet hole. That's not something that you would just misspeak on. So let's roll the clip first. Neil Heslin telling Megyn Kelly of his experience with his, with, uh, with his kid. At Sandy Hook Elementary School, one of the darkest chapters in American history was a hoax. I lost my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. Neil Heslin's son, Jesse, just six years old, was murdered, along with 19 of his classmates and six adults, on December 14th, 2012, in Newtown, Connecticut. Yeah, I dropped him off at 9.04. That's when we dropped him off at school with his book bag. Um, hours later, I was picking him up in a body bag. Okay, so making a pretty extreme cl claim that would be a very thing vivid in your memory, holding his dead child. Now, here is an account from the coroner that does not cooperate with that narrative. Uh, we did not bring the bodies and the families into contact. We took uh, pictures of them, uh, of, of their facial features. You have, uh, uh, it's, it's easier on the families when you do that. Uh, a time and a place for a close and personal in the grieving process. But to accomplish this, uh, we felt it would be best uh, to do it this way. And uh, you can sort of, uh, you can control the situation uh, depending on your photographer. And I have very good photographers. Uh, but uh, it's going to be hard not to have been able to actually see her. Well, at first I thought that, and I had questioned maybe wanting to see her. Okay, so just another question that people are now going to be asking about Sandy Hook, the conspiracy theorists on the internet out there that have a lot of questions that are yet to get answered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the event. That's just a fact. So there's another one. Will there be a clarification from Heslin or Megyn Kelly? I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> so now they're fueling the conspiracy theory claims. Unbelievable. We'll be right back with more. After four years of research, Okay, did you hear the part in there where Mr. Schroyer said, you would remember if you held your dead kid, that is not something you would misspeak on? Yes, I heard that. He's calling Neil Heston a liar, isn't he? He's calling Neil a liar and he's saying that, that Jesse didn't die, that he didn't exist. That he didn't exist. He's not really saying that he didn't hold Jesse. He's saying he didn't exist, right? What did that do to Neil when he heard that? I, I don't know. You can see what it did to me. I, I was just, I, I watched this video and I thought, this guy has no feelings. He does. He didn't check his facts. I would imagine that when Neil heard that, he was incensed. Again, somebody is calling him a liar. Somebody is saying that his son didn't exist. That's That's just... Did you see? Did you see in Neil's affidavit where he said after he, he found out about this, fear dominated my thoughts. Yes, that? I saw that. Is that consistent with your treatment and what you saw in your notes? Yes, as of in when he realized that uh, this this was real, this was going on. You could see um, you could see Neil change. There was a lack of emotion. There was a lack of uh, affect. Um, and he was focused on, I, I've got to right this wrong. This is not right. How do you try to right that wrong? Um, we're here today. Um, he, he went on Megyn Kelly a year before to try to say, please stop. 
Um, when that didn't work, I, I think he said, I, I've got to go take the next step. This is the system we hold people accountable in America, right? That's right. It's sort of what separates us from, from wild animals who just fight each other to death, right? Right. Just criticism. Been, you've heard the criticism that he filed this lawsuit and somehow making it worse. This is what he has to do, right? I, I think it's what he, what he feels he has to do, yeah. If, if Alex Jones doesn't stop, then he has to do this. He's got to say, this is real. My son was real. I helped my son. When he went on Megyn Kelly, he was reaching out to Alex Jones before he filed this case, right? That's correct. He was hoping that that, that would get him to stop. And it didn't. Did he discuss with you his fear for his own personal safety? Well, I, it, it's that's the, the new injury, is that now he not only is, is aware that there are a number of people, and I don't care if it's one or six billion, I don't care. But there are a number of people who are believing that Sandy Hook was a hoax. And so he needs to, uh, he needs to right that wrong. Is the realization that people believe Sandy Hook Elementary was a hoax, is that a new and separate and distinct injury from the loss of Jesse? I, I think the... You know, I, I think the loss of Jesse is is uh, a loss by itself. You know, you can't make that okay. You can't. Um, he's not going to recover from that. We'll find a place to put it. The new injury is his own personal safety, and that there are people. Yes, there are people that believe that Sandy Hook was a hoax, and he he has to set that right. That became his sole That's purpose. his sole purpose, yes. I want to talk to you a little bit about Scarlett. I know you didn't get a chance to see her as often. I saw her only about 10 times. Uh, that was, was that all in 2020? 2020. Okay. Tell me a little bit about what she was going through. Can you tell me about that? Um, you know, she was so, there was, things were out of balance. She was so focused on choose love. That was her focus. And that was how she was healing the loss of Jesse was was staying focused on that. So there there was a loss of um, a, a, a balance, so personal happiness that didn't happen. Uh, she did like to have people over and have dinner parties, and she didn't do that anymore. She loved going out on her boat. That was her happy place, and she talked about um, how Jesse loved the boat, and all of that was taken away. When, when she lost Jess. Was she, was some of the obsession with work, was it related to um, her fear that it was caused by Alex Jones? Um, I can only assume. I, I, she never really talked about that, but she, just things were out of whack. Okay. She focused more and more and more on, uh, on she was low. Um, yes. I think he'd still be grieving. He and Scarlett both would be grieving the loss of Jesse. But I do think that he would have found a, a way to uh, return to life, have um, a more social life, have more of a, a work life, more balance in his life. I think he would have found a way. And, you know, Scarlett would continue to choose love because that's how she's healing. But would Neil still live in Connecticut? I don't know. But he would, uh, he would definitely have more balance in his life. Why is this trial, why is this case important to Neil and Scarlett? They have, they need to, to, to know and to have the world know that that their son mattered, that he lived. 
they were good parents. And, and so they still feel I've got to protect that memory and that honor of, of our son. And so that would still be going on. But they wouldn't be so scared as they are right now. Um, they wouldn't have to fight this, or as, as significantly fight, this belief that Sandy Hook was a hoax. They're still protecting Jesse. They're, they are absolutely still protecting their son. Thank you, Mr. All right. Mr. Al? Thank you, Your Honor. When the world found out what had happened at the Sandy Hook Elementary School, how would you describe the reaction at the time? I, I think the world um, opened up and supported those, the, the people uh, who had lost children, uh, the teachers who had died. Uh, I think they tried to support them any way they could. And how did they do that? Oh my God, they sent. <laughs> hundreds of thousands of uh, stuffed animals. Um, I remember there was there was a, a religious group that s showed up and were uh, going to confront the families and the Hell's Angels literally lined the streets and made sure that they didn't get in, in close to those families during the funerals. Did um the Connecticut, uh, let's say the, the state government, did they support uh, the families in the town of Newtown? They did. The state troopers, each of them took a family who had lost a child and stayed with them up to a year. You mean lived in their home? Didn't live in their homes, but, but made sure that they were there first thing in the morning and left when they went to bed. And for many of those state troopers, did that relationship end? Um, in, let's say, the first 2014? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it goes on. Do you know who the uh, state trooper was that was assigned to Mr. Hessel? I do not. Uh, Ms. Lewis? I do not. Did um, President Obama come to? I him? think he did. And I think the governor came through. <laughs> and um, do you know if do you know that Scarlett Lewis uh, got to meet President Obama? I, I don't know. I, I do know that that um, they missed Trouve, the state troopers that, yeah, the state troopers that were uh, there on that day and stayed in that room for up to a week. I'm sorry, they missed? They, for some reason, didn't stop there and didn't invite them to the Oh, okay. What effect did that have on the troopers of Troop A? It was devastating to them. It was sad. They felt like their government wasn't supporting them? I think so. Uh, you spend most of your time working with first responders. Um, a significant amount of my time. And I, I, and I say that you have several YouTube videos out. Uh, I have one, uh, one TEDx talk on, on grit. If I can disagree with you, I think you have two pieces. Yeah, there's a speech as well where you go through everything. Well, it doesn't I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe so. Um, the, in, in your speeches, and I'll just ask you now, you believe that post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, treatable. 
I do believe that. And um, the method that that you use is mm -hmm. called EMDR. That's correct. And I think you said that it's been around for a long time. Since the late 80s. Yeah. And how effective do you find it to be in the treatment of PTSD? Um, very effective. You know, some people it takes as little as three, six sessions. Others, it can go on. And Others find it not helpful. So. You also say that um, PTSD is an injury that can be seen in the brain through imaging. Correct. And please describe that. Um, if you if you do a PET scan of the brain, you will it it'll light up. You'll see red areas, and it, your brain is trying to figure out what happened and how to how to resolve it. If you've had a, almost had a car accident. You might for 15 minutes or so go, oh my God, what just happened? And then you go, okay, I'm okay, I survived, and I'm all right. When there's a log jam, that's when you got a problem. What are you referring to when you say there's a log jam, and how do you see that? Okay, so when, when there is something that keeps the, the trauma, keeps the image present in your brain, then, then we have a problem. Um. Have you ever done any forensic work? Uh, no. Would you think that conducting such a PET scan would be a, a useful tool in diagnosing somebody with or without PTSD? It would be a useful tool, not the only one. Uh, <coughs> you're familiar with the DSM-5? Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain to the members of the jury what that is? Yeah, it's a diagnostic manual. Um, that we use to determine, you know, in fact, the DSM-1 had 100 diagnoses. The DSM-5 has a little over 300. And you can argue what, what that's about, but that's, that's the difference. And, and it's, it's how we diagnose. And there's a list of symptoms. And you work with it often, mm -hmm. almost you know, routinely. That's, that's correct. Um, in order to diagnose PTSD, what symptoms have to be present? Um, there are a number of them. Uh, uh, avoidance of something that reminds you or uh, uh, is, is similar to the, the, the uh, issue that, that brought on the trauma. Um, some of those symptoms are similar to depression. Uh, problems sleeping, problems with concentration problems with focus, those kinds of things. The, um, when we speak of trauma in terms of the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of trauma are we talking about? There are a number of things, and it, it's really how the individual responds to it more than, than the, this, the symptom. Is it fair to say that in the DSM, they, uh, they they limit trauma to uh, physical or sexual assault upon yourself or a loved one. I think, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure about that. I think it would be physical, sexual, and emotional okay. assault. So any kind of, your testimony here today is that you believe that any type of an emotional uh, assault qualifies for post-traumatic stress disorder? I would say so, yes. Um, would it be helpful to you to look at the DSM-5? Might be.
Thank you. Ask some questions, perhaps put in front of the witness and ask him some questions. Well, you're you're trying to get you're trying to refresh his recollection with this document, so you have to know what you're showing him. So, can you not tell? I don't mind if he shows it, um, Mr. Krause, Mr. Krause says this is it, but that, that's very nice. Uh, I'll allow that. All right, then you can look, show it to him. I don't know if this is the DSM number one. Um, I, I can tell you, it, yeah, yeah, it, it's not a, about in the DSM, it doesn't say the child rarely or minimally. So this must be about children. If I, if I may, I think it refreshed when you're reading about reactive attachment this morning. Okay, but, okay. But if, if let me ask you a couple more questions. Um, does the, are you familiar with the, uh, is it the American Psychiatric Institute that publishes the DSM? Um, yes. And if you, uh, do they publish it both in a print copy as well as uh, digitally they online? They do. And please take a take a look and see if that appears to be the digital version of the DSM-5. You know, I think this is a an explanation of what the DSM-5 might say. Um, it's very brief. The, the symptoms uh, of, of trauma and stress are uh, outlined differently in the DSM. Yeah. If you look here. Uh, yeah. So. Again, this is not the DSM that I'm, I'm aware of. How often do you visit with Mr. Heston? Uh, it depends. Uh, it's been weekly and it's been uh, monthly. It depends on the meal calls. Has it ever been more than once a week? Uh, no. And how much do you charge? Uh, 195 per session. And you've been seeing him for about nine years, ten years? Been seeing him since 2013, so nine years, yeah. What intervention are you recommending for Mr. Hessel at this point? At this time, what we're doing is, is talking about what he's going through. We're not doing the MDR right now. Have you used the MDR, Mr. Mm -hmm. I have, yes. And have you had some success with it? Uh, I have. Do you hope to have more success with it in the future? Uh, I do. Do you believe that uh, Mr. Heslin can recover? I believe that Mr. Heslin can find a way to put memories of Jesse in a, in a place where he can return to work, well, he's, he is working, but where his work will be um, um, actually he may retire, uh, but he will be able to have a life. And that's an achievable goal in your view? I think that is achievable. And when you talked before, it's, um, I think you testified words to the effect of, tell me if you agree that it is when you lose a child in this manner, it is something that in some way or another will haunt you for the rest of your life. I think that's true. And I, I think what's important, and I talked about long jams. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Alex Jones is a log jam. What happened to Neil, that's a log jam. The, uh, the log jam, and I wanted to get our timeline mm -hmm. a little bit cleaned up, uh, because I heard 2013, and then I heard 2008. Mm -hmm. When did Alex Jones become an issue for me? I think he became an issue um, in 2013 uh, when Neil was aware that people were claiming that uh, Newtown had not happened. Then he really became an issue in 2018 when Neil realized that he was directly being attacked, viciously attacked. Between 2013 and 2018, um, was Mr. Heston actively engaged with rumination about Alex Jones, or had he um, moved on? I think he was avoiding that issue, and he said, I, I don't want to dignify uh, that issue right now. So had he moved on, that's, uh, I wouldn't say moved on is, is an accurate term. He had found a way to avoid, ignore what and, was going on. And he had he'd exercised his power to, to sort of choose to shut that down. Well that's that's a symptom of, of trauma, isn't it? I'm gonna I'm gonna disconnect from something that is troubling to me. Isn't that healthy though? It's um, I would suggest no, not in not in Mr. Heslin's case because it kept the injury alive. How, um, in your notes, how often do you see Alex Jones's name appearing between 2013 and 2013? I don't. I do not see Alex Jones's name because Neil was choosing to not not dignify it, not go there. And did you? Right in your notes, Mr. Heslin is actively avoiding Alex Jones and dealing with that? No, because he didn't talk about it. And I, quite honestly, didn't know about Alex Jones until 2018. So based on your treatment of Mr. Heslin and your personal contact with him, the mm -hmm. first time Alex Jones comes up is in 2018. That's correct. As a, um, as Mr. Heslin's therapist, uh, you have a implicit and explicit contract with him to act in his best interest. Uh, as I as I see it not necessarily as he sees it. And that is to, um, you're not, your relationship isn't defined by um, necessarily giving testimony in court. It's defined by whether or not Mr. Heslin is improving. Um, I guess you can say that. And as, as, as part of that, um, it's not your job to go out and investigate or question whether what Mr. Heslin is telling you during your sessions is the truth rather than his truth. I think my job is to uh, listen to what he has to say and help him move towards uh, a, a more functional life. And I guess what I mean, and maybe this will be a better question, after you have a session with Mr. Heslin, you don't go out and investigate if what he told you is true or not true. No. That's not part of what you do. That's right.
Can you tell this jury to a reasonable degree of medical certainty how much of Mr. Heslin's uh, or Ms. Lewis's emotional pain uh, was caused by the murder of their son by the killer Adam Lanza versus the talk show host Alex Jones? I, I think that uh, those are two separate questions. Um, the loss of a child absolutely is is devastating and and causes grief and pain that I'm not sure as a parent you ever get over. But when I talk about log jams, so in 2018 when Neil realized that he was being targeted and that the credibility of his son and and of Scarlett and Neil was being challenged. That's a new injury. So um, from two, from 2018 when he realized, oh my God, this is this is real and this is happening to to us. Um, I, I think Neil became very focused on getting uh, some honor and and some clarity about his memory of. of Jesse. How much? I don't know. I could say 100%. I could say whatever. It's painful. And, and so what, what Alex Jones has said is painful to him. And he has said uh, it's too painful. So what I'm hearing you saying is that you consider it to be a new injury, but that within the course of dealing with a patient, it's very difficult to take a particular constellation of emotional pain and put it into one bucket or into a different bucket. I, I think that, again, there are two buckets here. One is the loss of a child, and that's always painful and will, and will never really be healed. The other is the belief that, and the accusation that it didn't happen. That's painful. And, and that's a different bucket, and that bucket's full right now. I, um, when you testify about negation, that Alex Jones is negating <coughs> the existence of Mr. Heston and Ms. Lewis's son. Mm -hmm. I can't call it a log jam. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, you are basing that off of what Mr. Heston and what Ms. Lewis have told you and not on a dispassionate analysis of the evidence. I'm basing it off of, yes, what Neil and Scarlett have told me, but also what I have observed um, on the internet in terms of uh, watching Alex Jones claim it was fake. In, in, since you um, are a member of the community <coughs> and you did that, you went online to search out that claim, can you tell us in what year and for how long Alex Jones said that it was fake? I don't know when, when he said that or, or when he started. No, I don't know. That's what Alright. We have a lot. Uh, okay, I think we'll just keep going and do a break and questions all at the same time. Mr. Krauss, did you sort of pick up on this theory that maybe Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis was not being honest with you? Um, I, uh, there was a challenge of that. You find that ironic in this case? Um, a little bit, in that I, I, I know that they have been very honest with me, that they trust me. They pay you money to, to, to help them, right? That's correct. Actually, I get paid by uh, Sandy Hook. Okay. We pay by the town. You were asked whether the EMDR is effective for PTSD. Mm -hmm. Is EMDR effective to treat PTSD if the PTSD is ongoing and complex and that trauma hasn't stopped yet? 
No. Nothing is, quite honestly. Mr. Reynolds? Thank you. All right. Um, so then, jury will combine. It's 346. We'll, we'll do a 30 minute break and question break. Remember all of my instructions about how these questions go and everything else, please. Thank you. You are excused. All rise.
probably said it most people are coming. So, so yeah, it's good, but like I said, only the things that we used in the trial are going to go back to the jury. So I've got that. So what I did was just circle the X for those. Yeah, it's really interesting because she wanted them all up there. No, but she told us after each other, right? all the admitted is this will be up there. Whenever the jury starts deliberating, we're only going to take ones back there. Okay. We've been keeping track. Uh, I, I, I've got, I've, so uh, the only thing i got to remember is to do.
Scarlett are at all interested in the money that might come from this case. Besides this lawsuit, what other ways have you suggested that Neil cope? As a member of the Trauma Recovery Network and your association with the Sandy Hook community, are you familiar with any other parents or teachers or first responders? Very complex question. Who have been targeted with threats or actual violence by persons that claim Sandy Hooks was a hoax? Should we add judges to that? <laughs> Did Mr. Heslin receive a PET scan to determine PTSD? If it is not an important method to determine PTSD, then what is the value of the PET scan ever used for? We gotta shut the door. Are you still treating families from Newtown from, from this tragedy? I mean, he's still treating Mr. Heslin, right? Do you know if any of these families are affected from this case? I don't understand that question, so that one's out. That doesn't make any sense. Does the duration and quantity of instances dictate the degree of traumatic injury sustained? If not, can duration and quantity of instances magnify the severity of the trauma inflicted? What would matter more to Neil and Scarlett, a public or private, this is the same juror, a public or private apology from Alex Jones and Infowars or monetary compensation from him? How much difference has Scarlett Lewis's foundation Choose Love made in the lives of other children or their families? How is Choose Love funded, if at all? All right. Do you think Neil and Scarlett are at all interested in the money that might come from this case? I mean, I don't know that he, it's not a question's not necessarily a problem, but the witness is the problem, right? And potentially the answer, if it's I mean, sort of we have a many of not going to charity and also right, not saying that they're going to spend it on charity. You mean right? Um, I mean, I think that that's a question that you can ask the plaintiffs when they're on the stand, but I don't know that this is a question to ask the, psych the psychologist. Besides this lawsuit, what, what other ways have you suggested that Mr. Hessen cope? I think that one's fine. As a member of the Trauma Recovery Network and your association with the Sandy Hook community, are you familiar with any other parents or teachers or first responders who've been targeted with threats or actual violence by persons that claim Sandy Hook was a hoax? Seems all right. Did Mr. Heslin receive a PET scan to determine PTSD? If it is not an important method to determine PTSD, then what is the value of the PET scan ever used for? I think those are all fine. Are you still treating families from Newtown from this tragedy? Seems fine. Does the duration and quantity of instances dictate the degree of traumatic injury sustained? Fine. If not, can duration and quantity of instances magnify the severity of the trauma inflicted? I think those are fine. 
What would matter more to Neil and Scarlett, a public or private apology from Alex Jones at InfoWars or a monetary compensation program? I think that's the same problem. How much difference, I don't think he can, I don't think, I don't know. How much difference has Scarlett Lewis's foundation Choose Love made in the lives of other children or their families? I just don't think he has any information about that. This is not the proper witness. Okay. And then how is Choose Love funded, if at all? I feel like, again, I mean, maybe we'll ask her, but I don't think we ask him. Okay. Those are the only questions. On the record, we've gone over the questions submitted by the jury. Uh, are you in agreement with those we've decided to ask, uh, Mr. Farah? Yes. Mr. Raynell? Yes. All right. Before we go to the jury, back in, uh, Mr. Paul's got one quick issue. Okay. Uh, just, we're really close to the end of the day. We were going to call Jesse Lewis. That's what Jesse was, JT. And um, JT Lewis, long story short, we're not. And we didn't think that we were, we thought we were going to be at the end of the day. So we'd like to just, have another 15 or 20 minutes, something like that, work on the jury charge, something you like that. You want to let the jury go home early today? Yeah. Okay. Start again tomorrow. Um, we do need to talk about the jury, so I think that's probably fine. So you're not going to call them at all, or you're not going to call them today? We're not going to call them at all. Okay. That's probably good. All right. Um, I am assuming, while we're sitting here talking about it, that we are not going to, we've gone through all the uh, depots. Uh, we have a witness for the second phase. Right, that I can comment. Correct, right, Your Honor, yes. We're not calling. And then we, and then we have two more witnesses left in our first phase. Okay. So, I mean, so I, I, the I, rest I, of the the rest of your witnesses you're not planning to call, just Mr. Uh, Hessel and Ms. Lewis? That is correct, Your Honor. And I, I don't expect for them, at least from the direct, to be on for any extended period of time. So I think that we would be finished with our case in the first phase tomorrow by, you know, noon at, at the very latest, at the absolute latest, and then probably before that really. All right. And will you be calling any independent witnesses of your own, Mr. Reynolds? Independent, you mean other than my client, Your Honor? I mean other than, are you going to call any witnesses in your phase of the case? This I, phase of the case? I still haven't decided. If I called a witness, it would be my client. Okay. Um, well, Your Honor, we need to know who's being called. Yeah, I mean, I make them tell everyone. <laughs> yeah. So you, got, you have till five to decide. How's that? But I can tell that if I call any witness at all, it would be him. Well, you have until 5 to tell us what your plan is for tomorrow. Okay? Just like I've made them every single day tell us who's going to be up next. That's the rule in this courtroom. All right. Let's bring back uh, the witness and the jury. You may be seated. All right. Um, 
So Dr. Crouch, I'm going to read some questions for you to answer, and I need you to just listen to the question and answer it for the jury, okay. uh, and let me know if you don't understand it, we'll probably move on, something like that, okay? Jury, same instructions as always, if you don't hear your question, that's because I made that decision, and you can direct your frustration in my direction. All right. Ready? Yeah. Besides this lawsuit, what other ways have you suggested that Mr. Heslin cope? Um, again, I, I think, you know, counsel talked about two buckets. There's coping with the death of his son, and then there's coping with uh, somebody who says he's a liar. So I'm not sure there's another way to cope with that. I think he's tried to cope with, uh, when he talked to Megan Kelly, he tried to cope he tried to say, please stop, and that, that didn't work. So in terms of that log jam, I don't think there's another way to cope. Uh, in terms of the death of his son, um, I, I think that it's that the grief is complicated, and I think that we will return to EMDR when, when the log jam is out of the way. And hopefully we can find a way to get him to uh, re-enter his life. And the same thing with Scarlett, to find some balance for him or her. As a member of the Trauma Recovery Network and your association with the Sandy Hook community, are you familiar with any other parents or teachers or first responders who have been targeted with threats or actual violence by persons that claim Sandy Hook was a hoax? Only, um, only in dealings with the parents and uh, uh, as a co-coordinator of the Trauma Recovery Network, uh, there are other clinicians who struggle with that, who have dealt with uh, the belief that, uh, that they're liars, that this didn't happen. And, and I think that they are all watching what happens in this trial. Did Mr. Heslin receive a PET scan to determine PTSD? No, he did not. Um, it, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was going to say there's a second part. If it is not an important method to determine PTSD, then what is the value of it? What is it used for? Okay. Um, it's not that it's not an important way of determining PTSD. It's, it's one of the many ways. Um, we can do a PET scan, and you can see that there's a there's a block, and it's it's relatively new uh, PET scans uh, in terms of seeing the brain uh, and um, where there is injury. Uh, PET scans um, I've just started to hear about them over the last ten years or so. Um, if EMDR has been around since night. Hit the, the late 1980s, uh, PET scans in, in, in are, are relatively new. Um, uh, I don't use them, one, because it costs money, <laughs> two, um, because if you listen to the, the symptoms, um, you know that, that someone has been traumatized, and to what level they are. Does the duration and quantity of instances dictate the degree of traumatic injury sustained? Could you read that again? Of course. Does the duration and quantity of instances dictate the degree of traumatic injury sustained? Um, you know, it's just another trauma. Um, so, uh, and, and it may be different. Um, you know, as a car accident, it's the same as uh, uh, another form of trauma, um, you know, sexual abuse. Uh, the death of a child is one trauma. I think I testified to that. The, the belief that, that you're a liar and that uh, Jesse didn't exist is another trauma. And uh, that will require uh, a treatment for that specific incident. Right. 
Can duration and quantity of instances magnify the severity of the trauma inflicted? Um, I, I would say yes, that um, if there are if there are numerous instances of the same trauma, um, for instance, in in sexual abuse, if if it went on for an, a number of years, then yes, I think the trauma is more severe, as opposed to a single instance, instance trauma. So yes. Um, Dr. Krebs, those are the questions that I have for you. I want to thank you for your time and your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, and you're free to go back down. Um, so we uh, had, a, the lawyers and I had a brief conversation during the break. We are expecting, um, we have some expectations about how the day tomorrow will go. And to get there, we have some work that we need to do outside the presence of the jury. Given the late time of day, what I've decided to do is just release you today to go home. And we'll start again tomorrow. So I'm hoping you'll arrive at 8.45 just like normal, ready to go. Remember all of my instructions. No news, no social media, no conversation, no research. Thank you, and I'll see you tomorrow. All rise. Steele has something to go over with you, and if you'll just shut that door, the last one through, I appreciate it. All right, you may sit down. We can, I think, go off the record. This is an informal conference, so we can go off the record and you can relax. Let me uh, do the time before we do anything else so I know where we are. side is used 14 hours and 50 minutes the defense side eight hours jury and work without the jury five hours and 40 minutes so that's where we are on that all right I've given you um, one second I'm sorry version one, you'll see down at the bottom, I, I make a little V dot whatever version one, so that we are always all in the same one. So make sure yours says V dot one down there in the footer, um, charge of the court. This is my current proposal, so I don't know if you have to be faster. Uh, as far as the text of the entire charge? Yes. Uh, I love it, have no problems. Okay. Sorry, no objections. Well, that was easy. Uh, yeah, that from our side is pretty easy. I did want to raise one instruction or to instruct the jury on an element of law that I think has been um, confused, and particularly in this last series of movies. And one is the idea that in pain and distress that may have been that the plaintiffs may have suffered due to participating in advancing the lawsuit itself is somehow not the defendant's fault, and that either we inflicted that on them. Mm -hmm. or they inflicted that on themselves. But the, the defendant is responsible under Texas law for all damages which are reasonably foreseeable for from its wrongful conduct. And that would include the vindication of that conduct in a court of law. 
we would like an, an instruction that says something along the lines of, and we may need to work on this, but is that damage caused by participating in this litigation were foreseeable to Mr. Jones from the defamation and IED he committed. Uh, we think otherwise we're going to send the jury back into that room with a false impression of Texas law that they did this to themselves by bringing this lawsuit. Can you, um, say, can you say all of that? Not all of it. Just the, the part. The instruction part? Yeah, just the instruction Here's part. Here's what I came up with. Sure. It was damages caused by damages caused to the plaintiffs by participating in this litigation was foreseeable to the defendants due to the defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress they committed. And again, yeah, we would say, and is therefore part of the compensable damages of the plaintiff. Okay. Well, I think I'll need you to send me that uh, written down because I, sure. I had started it from a different direction, so I couldn't quite get everything you said. Absolutely. Any um, other instructions you think you'll be requesting? And do you want this, are you requesting that this go in the charge as a legal instruction? It's one of my instructions, or are you requesting it some, uh, be delivered to the jury in some other format? I would leave that to discretion of the court. Okay. I, I certainly think it could be done during the um, sort of introductory last instructions you give before the charge of the court mm -hmm. separately, or it could be in the charge of the court. I, I, from our perspective, that form doesn't make a lot of difference to us, so I leave it to your discretion. So, what it, what I think it most closely resembles is an instruction, for example, on um, a code in the state of Texas. Right. And those would typically appear in the charge. In itself. itself. Right. So I'm, I'm open to hearing the argument, but I'm thinking that it, that it makes the most sense to include it as an instruction of the law in Texas in the charge. Um, that, would, that would be my belief as well. Okay. I think that would be the most appropriate way to do it. I think that's, it's the most analogous to something like that, where I've taken judicial notice of a code. And then I will, I'll say for the record that I will get this. Well, we're not on the record. Oh, that's right. This is an informal charge okay, conference. For everybody in the room, uh -huh. I will get this written down on paper and give it to everybody at 5 o'clock. Okay, that's fine. Or, you know, right around yeah. there. Yeah, right tomorrow here. morning, yes. Okay. Anything else? Uh, nothing from plaintiff's side. All right. Any, um, anything you want to talk about during the informal charge conference? And I do want you to talk about everything. Don't, I do okay. not like it when lawyers save issues with the charge to the formal charge conference. The formal charge conference in this courtroom is an opportunity to briefly relate things that have already been discussed and decided for the record if necessary and to otherwise just express agreement with the charge in the form it is in. Does that make sense? Great. As I mentioned earlier, we were going to ask for there to be a separate line for each defendant. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand the the scope of the default is is within your honor's discretion. I, so I, I'm not sure, just looking at the page itself, that the default has the alter ego finding. Um, your honor will decide. Right. I thought we had already discussed this in uh, pre jury trial conversations where I made it clear that in fact it was part of the petition, it was part of the default, Alex Jones equals free speech systems. Understood. Okay. Well, the, the other thing I'd just like to say about that, hopefully it'll clear it up and we won't have to do anything on the charge conference, is the default most certainly includes the conspiracy claim. And under the conspiracy claim, once they're both found for the conspiracy of defamation, now they're jointly and separately liable. And so there would be no reason on the charge to separate it. That's what we looked into, why we didn't do that in our submission. Right. Well, we also have a, a joint venture, joint empire. Right. We, we have, have all, all of the, all the business language. That's exactly. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so under either, we believe. Right. What else, Mr. Reynolds? I have nothing else to say. Okay. 
Do you have a response to uh, Mr. Bankston's suggestion regarding the instructions to Texas law and damages that may that a juror may think come from bringing suit? I haven't done the research, Your Honor. Uh, I would I will look at it tonight. Okay. Um, that's okay. That's totally fine. Um, if and I don't know that we will, but if we finish with evidence tomorrow, and I guess it's not five, but it's pretty close. If you do not put on Mr. Jones, that's what I assume you're mentioning, you mean when you say my client? Correct. Your okay, you're not planning to put on somebody else for the corporation? No, you're not. Okay, other than Mr. Jones? Correct. All right, so if you put on Mr. Jones, I don't think we'll, cl we'll finish in time for closings tomorrow. But if you don't, we might, I don't know. We might not. Um, but let's say we do, uh, we will we will close. So that might restrict a little bit of the time. So I'll need you to tell me how much time you need and want for closing. Because what I hate to do, I hate to lose, like waste two hours. But I also worry, based on openings and all the other stuff, that two hours might not be enough for closing. So. I don't know. Do you have thoughts about that? I don't know. Oh, also, who's doing open and who's doing closed? You're, You're doing both? Yes, Both open, closed, and closed, closed. Right. Okay. And you know about fully fully closing in your open, closed. All the non queers are like, what is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, because that's, that's important. Okay. All right. Um, so. so that's okay. Do you have a time restriction between the open and the close? In other words. No, so at this stage, um, looking ahead to the time, so deliberation doesn't count against anybody. Um, we've got, so tomorrow is Tuesday. Let's, let's just assume closings are Wednesday morning. Okay. Um, so they take the whole morning. So then, there's a day and a half of attorney trial time for the second phase. So with that, I would say, if you just keep that in mind, you keep the numbers I've been giving you in mind, I'm not going to limit you. I will give you whatever time warnings you like, but I'm not going to tell you your closing is 30 minutes and that's it. I'm just not gonna do that. You've got the time you've got. You can use it how you want to use it. That's your job. My job's not to let you go over the total time, and I won't. So, and my question is a little bit different. Oh. You know, some judges say, for instance, if you're going to use an hour for the opening and close, you can only do 10 minutes, like 10 percent or 10 mm. percent. And I, that was, I know you fully close, but as long as I fully close, there's no limit on that. It's rebuttal. Sure. So it's limited by what Mr. Reynal says. Right. But other than that, no, okay. I don't. Any questions about closing? Well, now we have 19 minutes. Are you going to put on Mr. Jones tomorrow? Can I use my 19 minutes to make a phone call, Your Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you could go out there. Too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I thought that was obvious. <laughs> Don't do it in here. I'm not going to leave, but I won't talk about the case. I'm just going to talk in an email. Thank you. 